Shinji and Warhammer 40k. Chapter 1. And Become Legend. Part 1. It swam past sunken skyscrapers, the stripped bare bones of mankind's arrogance. Arrayed along the shoreline were rows of warships and tanks along the highways. As the creature made its first step out of the waters, its foot crushed their renewed hope. Fifteen years of ignorance died at that moment. Fifteen years passed, the innocence of the world was raped out of it by the ambition of men who had become gods, and now the earth felt the touch of angry, abandoned children. This was the being known as Satiel. It was a giant, vaguely shaped like a man, with slick black skin like that of sea mammals, and for some strange reason, its rib bones seemed to be on the outside. Curving wedges of bone jutted out of its shoulders like pauldrons. Most distinctive about it, other than its maddening size, was the bone mask on its necklace head. The mask looked faintly bird-like, and behind the eye holes there was nothing but untold darkness. It stepped out of the waters of Sagami Bay, moving its spindly yet powerful limbs in punctuated jerks and utterly unconcerned at the assembly of forces ready to receive it. The full might of the military was brought to bear on the intruder. The first hot salvo came from the Type 110 tanks of the Japan ground SSDF lined along the highway. To Satiel, the rain of 140mm rounds, a mixture of long rod penetrators and high explosives, did not even rate the sensation of even pinpricks. Then, the warships of the Marine SSDF added their voice, booming out with larger calibre automatic cannons. Explosions rippled across the Angel's back, but they did not bother to even turn around. It seemed that not even all the machines of men would fail to break its stride. Yet Japan of 2015 was not the innocent nation of 2000. While constitutionally they still had outvowed war, theirs was now a much more varied and much more potent military force. Rising from behind the mountains, coming in from the bases in Gotemba and Odawara, the two cities next to Tokyo 3, it was the Air Force, having to close into near suicidal range just to target the immense creature. For some strange reason, radar and even laser rangefinders were funneling up around it. The JASSDF sent out a large number of VTOLs for this purpose. Satchel's masked face quivered. Unlike the previous two mass attacks, the incoming forces were deliberately putting themselves between it and its object objective. A massive missile, almost as large as the strike fighter carrying it, was released and shot forth towards the Angel. It was one designed to destroy hardened bunkers buried tens of metres underground. Satchel raised its clawed hand for the first time and caught it. The missile crumpled in its palm and engulfed a giant in flame. Satchel walked out of the billowing flames, unscathed, undaunted. Behind the mountains lay Hakone, and beneath Hakone was the call of a being older than worlds. Satchel could not feel the light of the soul from all the things that tried to impede its progress, and all were therefore irrelevant. Meanwhile, the completely automated railway system towards Tokyo 3 continued to roll on. The high-speed rail from Tokyo 2 to Tokyo 3 slid to a gradual stop. Its single passenger got off. Hope there were no security cameras in that thing, said Shinji Ikari. He couldn't help it. Being so alone felt so liberating. As a teenager, he wasn't supposed to give in to such childish urges anymore. You should have thought of that before you started to run on the cushions and then slide and swing on the handrails just because no one else was around, a stately female voice in his mind replied. Truly, you show all the signs of your monkey ancestry. He looked at the bars and thought, why not? What did he have to lose but his dignity? There was nothing to be scared of, and if he did end up being scolded, he was prepared to accept it. Wait, monkey is supposed to be monkey? Right? The teen noted with some disbelief. He was smiling indulgently. You've been calling me a monkey all this time? We have been calling your kind the monkey, the wild ones, for as long as your race have stood upright. It saddens me to be sure that you took this long to realise this. Some never do. So this is why you refer to me as a metal-skinned brute? Crofter the space marine, that my genetic enhancements only return me to my true mental state. 
this armour. These genocides are the finest fruit of the God Emperor's will. I thought you Eldar might have actually respected his mighty intellect. That was an insult all this time. See, Shinji? Disappointing. Be smoked for your heresy, foul Zeno Eldar witch! It's heresy only if I follow your religion, and I do not. She seemed to grin. Gorilla. Let me out, Commander. Get us out of this pack. There must be smiting. So much grunting. Would you like a banana? An inarticulate roar filled Shinji's mind, with a ho-ho-ho-ho breathing in and out. Hush, he said, suddenly alert. There was silence. There was too much silence. He looked about, and all the activity he could see were the blinking of streetlights. There was perhaps no danger for a 14-year-old to travel all the way from Sendai to Kyushu, but one of the mayor's friends had accompanied him to Tokyo too. Once there, he found out there was a train waiting for his arrival. The train official there looked irritated at the reserved line, but the train was not allowed to leave without him, and only him, and only at a certain time. It was odd, but not too implausible, that his father's connections would have a train only for him. For what he could not understand, it was a foolish waste of time and money, if maybe just to impress one perplexed teenager. But for the terminal to be without any people was simply unthinkable. Tokyo 3 was supposed to be a bustling city and a nerve centre of Japan's industrial and commercial efforts. Where is everybody? Shinji Ikari stepped out of the terminal and walked down the streets. The shops were all closed. There was not a single moving car to be seen. The speakers were saying something along the lines of, Please remain calm. Proceed to the nearest shelter. For some reason, he was feeling a heavy weight over his shoulders. He looked down at the photo sent to him. A woman in tight clothing leaning forwards, an arrow in red marker was drawn, pointing to her breasts. Look here, it said. Shinji quirked his lips up. He had to admit, as much as his father's message made him insulted and indignant, this one tickled his curiosity. What sort of person would send something like this? For years now, the voices in his mind had consoled him, berated him, told him things that should be outside of his knowledge and awareness. For most people, it would have faded into harmless fancy as they realised they were basically just talking to themselves. Shinji, who had never even entertained the notions that the voices were each their own identity separate from his own, was comfortable with asking them to double-check even his own senses. He took out a card from his pocket, and there was a red symbol, half of a fig leaf. Nerve. Below that, a telephone number. He saw a row of public phones some distance away. He went over and dialed it in. Hmm. No answer. He set the receiver back. This doesn't make sense. Why go all to all this far and not have anyone to meet me? Getting here was all prearranged. I had no real choice anywhere. So why just let me get off here and then expect me to manage on my own? I doubt your father would clear out an entire city just for the purposes of insulting you further, the farseer said to hide that she had no idea what was going on either. It's no good. Maybe I should go to a shelter? Not that I know where one is, anyway. Also, he mused, why were there shelters in the first place? Maybe you should have been paying attention to the news. Maybe there was a storm or tornado or something. That would nicely explain it, he nodded to himself, quick enough to suddenly appear all the while the train trundled towards Tokyo 3 in all the ignorance. He looked up at the sky. Unfortunately, the crystal calm belied that hypothesis. He felt something icy cold run up the back of his neck. A feeling of being watched. Shinji blinked. Wait, what is that? He saw someone standing across the street, a girl in a school uniform staring at him. Her blue hair was what drew his attention, and her red eye seemed to go straight into his soul and out his back, leaving his being a flayed but exultant mess. He felt a certain deep yearning settle over him, and faintly, almost unheard. And we are reunited. A flock of white birds suddenly flying off from a power line drew his attention for an instant, and when he looked back, she was gone. What was that? Did I imagine it? In the distance, something exploded. It comes! screamed the voice of chaos. Shinji's mind rang with a roar. He turned and felt a wall of... something. The pressure, squeezing his heart. What is this? 
His inner voices were suddenly all unable to speak. It came to him as a gust of wind. Shinji saw a tilt-ring rotor combat helicopter slide into view, discharging its missiles at something behind the buildings. It came as cleansing fire, as he saw that same gunship speared by a bright black bolt of energy, withdrawing back to a massive black arm just now coming into view. He shielded his face as the aircraft fell, whipping the air, crashing and chopping up the pavement near him. The giant strolled on unconcerned. I know this, Shinji shouted out for reasons he couldn't explain. I feel I should know this. Its gargantuan foot came close by, and Shinji could feel a slight breeze just from the air being pushed out of the way by its sheer mass as it walked. Shinji wondered if he should run away, except that something paralysed him. It wasn't fear, even as the animal part of his brain felt so small and insignificant. Foremost in his mind was this puzzling feeling of familiarity. It was like trying to make sense of a dream, trying to remember it in the moment just before consciousness fully engages back into wakefulness. Conveniently, a sports car screeched to a halt between it and him. The doors opened and a woman in a tight purple one-piece shouted at him, her face hidden behind large tinted driving sunglasses. Get in! He ran to it, sensing that the next step might actually land on top of the hapless vehicle. Once inside, the car sped out with maniacal speed and reckless turns around sharp street corners. They sought sufficient cover behind several building blocks. What was that? he said between frantic gulps of breath. So pure. So much personal hatred. What was that? What can man do against such black hate? That was an angel, Shinji. Misato said nonchalantly. That's what your father fights. Shinji looked back. An angel. My father fights that? Technically, the word she used was Shito. The expression was more linked to Avenger or Punisher. There was nothing intrinsically holy about it. Even so, now he felt strangely at peace. We might be getting into something we would not want to be in, Commander, was the Space Marine's warning. I can feel it. We all can. There's stompings that got to be done, added the orc war boss. There is blood, hissed the chaos marine. I can taste it. Blood waits for us here. Blood to feel a god to satisfaction. Are you afraid? He asked him. The farseer pulled deep into herself. Are you not? Your thoughts are our thoughts, Shinji. The future is close to me. I feel it. We are at the cusp of a scenario. We cannot see it, for we are part of it. The young teen turned his head back and sighed. He slumped against his seat. Can't escape it out now. I have to know. What are you up to, father? He looked up at the woman beside him. The large shades hid her eyes. She seemed serious and professional and nothing like the pictures she sent. He felt his eyes drifting down to the stretched folds near her chest and looked away sharply. He felt a certain amusement from her. Damn! So hidden by the reflective shades, she was looking at him instead of the road. Wasn't that... dangerous? Shinji faced forward, slumped back some more and obstinately jutted out his chin. He tried in this way to fight back his embarrassment. That only made Misato smile widely. The young teen just couldn't pull off a tough look. So you're Shinji Ikari, huh? She said, eyes back to the road. And you're Katsuragi Misato-san, he replied. Pleased to meet you. Yes, I'm sure, she added impishly. Nice kid, she thought. Still so innocent. He's going to be so much fun to tease. Who knows? I might even do something I might enjoy. She began to chuckle lightly, which for some reason made Shinji feel even more uneasy. Misato angled her neck to get a better look at the sky. That plane. It can't be. They wouldn't. She suddenly turned and yelled right at Shinji's face. Get down! The car swerved wildly away, and the sun came down from the sky. Misato Katsuragi shielded him with her body. She pulled him tight to her as the car was thrown off the road by the blast. The car tumbled up and over to its side and skidded off the highway, throwing sparks as the shock wraith passed over them. There was only the vague feeling of heat, but they could feel their ears pop from the sudden change in pressure. Through it all, Shinji thought... Maybe coming to Tokyo Free wasn't such a bad idea after all. I should be feeling outraged, says the farseer, miffed. But your thoughts are our thoughts. 
I am sure it is no surprise that perversion flows from one of the race that spawns Selanesh. Enough. We care not. Get your foot out of my face, woman. My foot, as you put it, is attached to my base. Stop kissing my plastic stand. She paused. You were trying to look up my skirt, weren't you? Weren't you? Damnation! Stop kicking me, woman! His imaginations were always the most lively when he needed to take his mind off something. He was only grateful for their timely distraction. Help your most devoted follower, old Dark Lord. Help me! Help! Die, die, and die again. Be resurrected by your dark gods to be killed by me again. After a while, Masato let him up from his breath-starved position. There was an end to mine. It seems to have stopped the angel for a while. Let's get moving. Shinji stared blankly at the rising red mushroom cloud. Aren't we going to die from, like, radiation? No, Shinji. N2 means non-nuclear. It has all the power of a nuke without the nasty side effects. They pushed the car back to rest on its wheels. Miss Sato bewailed her beautiful car. Shinji patted her back and said, Um, it's not that bad. The spirit of this machine is the same no matter what face it wears. Miss Sato stared back at him with incomprehension. The boy smiled sheepishly. He took his hand away and stared up at her. Aren't you a sh- soldier, Miss Sato-san? This is a soldier's car. Let it wear its scars proudly. She scrunched up her face at him. Not that she wasn't guilty of applying personifications to machines too, but it's not the time to be joking around pretending machines had identities. But Shinji-kun, I still had payments on this. People won't respect me if I'm driving around a piece of crap. This piece of crap got those bumps saving their skins. The young teen nodded, his face so serious. Miss Sato-san, screw him. That did it. She had to laugh. He was just too serious, and yet she could tell he meant well. She hugged him, pressing his face to her bosoms again. Aren't you just adorable? <laughs> You're right, Shinji-kun. Screw him. She slapped at the steering wheel, as if urging a horse to run. They went on their way. After a while down the road, the car rolled, rolled, slowed, and came to a stop. Silence. Misato turned her head and pointedly looked at the young teen sitting beside her. Shinji grinned weakly and rubbed the back of his head. The spirit is willing, but the metal is weak? Maybe you're not as cute as I thought after all, she huffed. Smash! Miss Sato chuckled as she hefted a bundle of heavy-duty batteries in her hands. Tokyo Free's hyper-efficient ideals worked against her. The electric car might be clean and cost-effective, but ultimately easy to knock out of proper working order. She didn't have time to fiddle around with the insides. Hopefully these would provide the additional power she needed for the existing engine lines. Um, is it really okay if we take this? We did break into a store after all. Isn't that stealing? She huffed again. She just knew the kid would be one of those unimaginative, law-abiding types. It's fine, it's fine. Nerve will take care of it, no problem. Now let's get go- The young teen finished placing his armload of batteries into the back seat. Really? Awesome! Can I go get something for me too? Her head turned with such unbearable slowness that it filled Shinji's heart with dread. Her gaze was grim and judgmental. He began to back away. Then all of a sudden, she cheered up and said, Sure, but remember this is an emergency, so be quick. Thank you, Miss Sato-san, Shinji bowed, then only painfully suppressing himself into as to look too much like a looter during an inner city riot. He rushed back into the store. Score! The boy had always been fascinated with hardware and construction tools, ever since he realised it was the only way to build a 1 to 10 inch scale battle titan. His childhood knew friendship and camaraderie, but association with the boys and their independent attitudes also taught him the joy of building things with his own bare hands. Oddly, it was the war boss and the mechs who'd admonished that building stuff was just as much fun as destroying it. Looting was, after all, gathering the scrap needed to make something bigger and better. Maybe the kid won't be so boring after all, the nerve officer mused while waiting. I wonder what he's going to get out of a hardware store. The kid came out holding a mini chainsaw. He was practising sword-like motions with it. Misato stared at him. Shinji felt her stare and grinned weakly. He held it out for her to see. May I have all the- may I have this? Shinji? Why out of all the things in the store, 
And by that I include the dirty magazines they hide behind the counter. Did you choose a chainsaw? Uh, because I've always wanted one and it'd be really useful where we're going. And that it's the closest thing to a chainsaw that I've seen so far. It was not a proper chopper, but better suited for him since he did not have to swing hard with each cut. Really useful. The words seemed to hit her face. Masato rubbed her cheek and straightened back up. Useful? What do you mean, useful? How could it possibly be useful where we're going? You know, we could be thrown off the road and we have to cut our way out of a mangled vehicle, or we might find a fallen tree blocking our path, or we might need to fight off scavengers and looters operating while the city's under attack. Shinji took a deep breath. A ripper's always useful when you need to resize a room or things to more manageable bits. <laughs> Miss Sato chuckled oddly. I'd imagine it if you say, Miss Sato, I'm riding with a psycho. She pulled herself together and pointed. Put it back, Shinji. I took those batteries for a reason. We're not here to pick up toys for you. But Misato-san... Misato crossed her arms over her chest. Shinji is a ranking officer of nerve and an authority over this city. You must obey me. His face fell. He let the mini chainsaw drop to the ground. It was such a perfect size for him, too. He woodenly walked over, complying. However, rather than entering the car, he simply stood before her. He kept his head down and his face under shadow. Shinji? asked Misato, slightly nervous. The young teen merely leaned forward and pressed his head into the flesh of her arm. Please, Misato-san. His voice was so tiny, she felt as if she crushed his dreams. Oh, all right, she retorted hotly. Go get whatever you want, but it stays in the car until you can pay it back with your own money. He looked up at her and his face just beamed. Thank you, Misato-san, he said with such honest rapture. He slid over to the chainsaw, dumped it in the back seat and rushed back into the store. She heard him say, Looks at that! Nail gun! With such unbridled joy. Misato stood there rubbing the flesh where he touched. It still tingled. She shivered for no reason. What is with this kid? They did not speak at all on the west of the ray towards Nerve. What was that about, Commander? The space marine asked. Did we just impose our will on this woman? Have we not sworn never to do that again? I don't know. Seems so right at the time. The war boss snorted. Well, I got me stuff, so I'm happy. What's it matter? It was a way to keep her off balance. She sent her picture to us in a forced act of intimacy that was designed to send us confused. We simply returned the favour, was the farce's helpful reply. It was a slaneshi greeting, said the Chaos Marine after a while. All beings in Shinji's mental landscape turned to look at him in wide-eyed horror. Flesh to flesh, need to need, can you not hear a soul? It screams in anguish, calling for comfort and acceptance. Shinji had to nod. That sounds more like it. She has been hurt before, and badly, so much so she wears her skin sexuality as a shield. She is a soldier. Her first reaction is always physical. I see. She shares her body, but not her soul. She aids for intimacy, and yet always spurns it when given. Shinji shook his head. How do I know this? She's still a stranger. Since when could we judge other people's hearts? Since the time you started to become comfortable with calling yourself we, was the Eldar's dooming answer. Nerve was inside the geo front. Shinji couldn't help to gasp, impressed, as the elevator bringing them down showed the dome lit from above by rays of reflected sunlight. It was huge. He could see buildings hanging off the roof like the stalactites of a cave. Though an enclosed space, it felt even larger. The ground he could see was green and forested. There was even a lake. A rope ray train line carried them to the geofront surface. Entering Nerve itself, the golden pyramid underground was just the tip of an iceberg. Much of it was apparently even deeper than that, behind levels and levels of metal. Moving walk rays conveyed them from one section to the other. Shinji looked around with undisguised awe. Let's see, mumbled Misato. If we came in here, then we should be coming out here. The door opened with a whoosh and air rushed up from below. It was a walk ray over a tall pit. 
This is why I hate wearing a skirt around here, she complained while adjusting at her noticeably more exposed legs. I wonder where the heck Ritsuko is. And all that shortly turned to frustration as it became clear they were thoroughly lost. They had yet to see anyone else around. Mentally, the space marine collapsed to his knees. It's like campaigning with Lee Man Russ all over again, he blubbered out to the heavens. How can you get lost three sectors on foot? How? I doubt Lee Man Russ had fies that that thought was interrupted with an internal frap to the head. He felt a disapproving tendril from his female advisor. That's true, said the space marine, his eyes slightly glazed. If only Lehman Russ had... She frapped him next. Finally exasperated, Misato went over to a phone and yet again paged her friend for help. As she did so, Shinji held the map. It was amazing. It completely failed to make any sense at all. Why did Section 3A lead to 6F and only then to 3B? It was like it was purposely made to confuse any invaders from gathering information. She had them enter yet another elevator, in the hopes of going deeper, somehow managing to strike gold location-wise. She yelped as the door opened to reveal someone already waiting there, her face showing all the impatience banked over the years of knowing Misato Katsuragi. Why are you wasting my time, Captain? She said flatly, aggressively entering Misato's personal space with an intense look. Don't you know we're short on time and manpower? Misato backed away from the force of that glare. <laughs> Sorry. Ritsuko Akagi turned to face Shinji and asked, So is this the boy? Yes, according to the Marduk report, he's the third child. Ritsuko saw the young teen quirk his left eyebrow at being regarded as if he wasn't there. He had, if just briefly, reacted to the words Marduk and third. Pleased to meet you, she said, a small smile crossing her face. Shinji smiled back. Hello there, he coughed. He'd been distracted by wondering how a swimsuit and a lab coat found their way together. I mean, pleased to meet you too, he said in Japanese and bowed. But I don't know your name. I think he might be even worse than his father, Miss Sato said with a grimace. To this, Ritsuko could only lift her eyebrow in much the same way as he did a few moments ago and experimentally said back in English, Ah, uh, that was impolite of me. My name's Ritsuko Akagi. What's yours? It's all right. My name's Shinji Akagi, but I think he's already knew that. I'm happy to meet you, Akagi said. Say, he bowed back. Ritsuko's smile grew a fraction. That's an interesting accent you have there. Where did you learn it? Here and there. Books. Never seen someone with blonde hair before. I'm not actually an American, even if I know English, Shinji. She replied. Of course, she wouldn't share so easily that it was dyed. My, what an uncouth boy he could sound like, lacking the dagger-like diction she knew from the other Ikari. Misato could actually understand English, having been raised to a multicultural expedition and been to many international postings, but had to say, I didn't understand that at all. Was that even English? Oh, sure, Ritsuko nodded and turned away from the young teen. Pure of English than most I hear around here, since it actually sounds like it comes from England. Granted, the very roughest parts of England, but who really cares? Practically the entire island was under the sea these days, she thought. The elevator went back up, and a woman spoke, ignoring Shinji. He took his time to listen. The geo front was at battle stations, but something known as Unital 1 was under refrigeration. It was supposed to be pretty important, but I didn't know if it would even work. There was a rather plain pun in the Japanese language, only and 0.009, but he learned that yes, it had never worked before. The chance of it working now was abysmal, and yet they had to keep it under cryogenic suppression. What was it that they made that they were afraid of? The moving walk ray went into a dark room. As soon as he asked why it was so dark, it snapped on, shocking him with the, review, the view of a gigantuan purple face. He felt again that strange pressure. Giant robot? He muttered. He started to leaf through the booklet they gave him, but fumbled his grasp. It fell off into the orange vat of coolant. He shrugged. No big loss. To Misato's indignant, Hey! He answered. That thing! He pointed to the giant robot. Wasn't even there, is it? No, but it could have had a lot of useful or other useful info and rules. His amused look implied. That you don't even follow? I sense something here, 
the farseer whispered. A soul that's not a soul, a mind that's not a mind. And rage, such aimless rage. The complex shook as the angel Satchel unleashed its energy attack upon the city. I have a feeling all the rules just cease to matter. You'd be correct at that, Ritsukon muttered under her breath. This is humanity's last and best hope, the artificial human Evangelion. Shinji quickly talked to her, and leaving no space after she finished talking, asked, What's its gender? What? I noticed you said artificial human with much practice. If this was an android or a battle machine, it would be genderless. You would have said humanoid, but you were careful to emphasize artificial human. His eyes, dark and focused, seemed to plunge into her. His tone was all too familiar, peeling away other people's barriers. The natural guiding characteristic of humanity is its duality, which allows for emotional attachments and beneficial mutation. I suppose it could be neutered, but people have called weapons from tanks to ships as he and she before. He smiled a bit. What's his or her name? Miss Ato scratched her cheek. It's a big fighting robot, Shinji. There's no male or female about it. Ritsuko's just being scientisty. They tend to get poetic that way. Ritsuko could only stare down with horror as Shinji reminded her too keenly of just whose son he was. At this silence point, Gendo Akari appeared in a blind passageway above the Evangelion. Hey, Shinji, he drawled out, his words friendly, his tone and expression completely not. It's been a while. Shinji Akari stared up at him. Yes, father, he replied with the same faux friendliness. It has. Ikari and Ikari stared at each other, motionless, unblinking, for what seemed like minutes etching away. What are they doing? Miss Sato whispered to her friend. Oh no, not here, not now, was all the response Ritsuko could give, her voice breaking. Not two of them. It was a poultry trick. To set oneself higher than another, a contest of wills and patience, Shinji was stunned that his father would have the sheer gall to resort to that level of intimidation. Part of what kept him staring was sheer wonder at the man's apparent immaturity when it all boiled down to it. Shinji was angry when he first read Gendo's letter, but through the journey he had come to realise he didn't really know much about his father at all. What are we doing? asked the space marine. The city is under attack and he wants to play these games. If his time is so valuable, he would not acknowledge you for that so many years. Then he has better concerns now than this posturing. Why have you sent for me, father? He shouted up. For years now you ignore me and now you want me again. Why? He put the right, right amount of childish anger into his voice. And by the emperor, Gendo actually looked pleased. There was the briefest of nods. We're moving out, Gendo Akari said, ignoring his son's outburst. Misato yelled something about a Unit Zero being in cryostasis, which further confirmed Shinji's impression of something inherently dangerous in that thing they called an Evangelion. Then, you're, you're using a Unit 01, she turned and shrieked at Ritsuko. She nodded impassively. There's no other way. But we don't even have a pilot. Ray can't do it, can she? We just received one. Ritsuko added numbly, still only barely managing to accept it. The women argued about how Shinji just has to sit on it. There was something about any chance at anyone getting a synchronisation. Shinji ba barely paid any attention. He only stared back up at his father, who stared blandly back. Sure, it was childish, but he was the child. This was all a setup. he realised. Misato was telling him to get into the Ava. Shinji tilted his head to the side, remembering what happened outside. No, I won't do it. Isn't there someone else? He asked without looking back. He could see it, faintly. He had to get out of the scenario to affect it. I just got here. Why can't you do it? Shinji, I would if I could, she said softly, pained. But I can't. You are our only hope. Humanity needs you, Shinji. We need you. Humanity? He bristled at their appeal. How dare she put humanity to him? He knew just how much he was willing to give up for humanity. Everything. But this? This is ridiculous. Then maybe you people shouldn't have been so stupid as to design a weapon system so picky about its pilots in the first place. 
One could almost hear the creak in Ritsuko's neck as she turned her head to bring her blazing eyes to bear. What did you say? I don't believe you, he shouted up to his father. You had me come all the way just for this. What if I didn't answer your summons? You never cared before. He turned to Ritsuko and frowned. I don't believe it. Me? It can't be me. You must have something else. Why this thing you're not even sure will even work? If this is the best humanity can come up with, then maybe it needs to reap the fruits of its stupidity. I mean, that thing! It's attacking us! It's coming here! Even I can tell it wants something here. Why is this the only real defence? Why don't you have a giant cannon the size of a house, the size of a mountain, to meet it? Why don't you just drop one of those buildings I saw on top there? Why not? This doesn't make sense. I don't believe you people who'd build a base as big and complex could be so incompetent. Why couldn't you have called for me earlier? Now it's just too inconvenient to all of us that I arrived during an attack. Why me? I'm just a boy. I don't have any training. This is completely wrong. Why are you relying on me? You're all adults. Why don't you have the power to solve your own problems? Ritsuko actually snarled at him. No! There is no other way. The Evangelion... The Ava! Her rage was such that her intellect fled, leaving her grasping for words. Miss Sato placed her hands on his shoulders. Her voice was gentle, caring. Shinji, I can't really explain right now, but there's an important reason why an Ava is the only thing that could fight angels. Please, Shinji. Though she did turn to Ritsuko and asked, Why don't we have a giant can of Biggs Mountain down here to meet it anyway? It has to break through the geofront at some point. It would be too expensive. Hard defences are impractical, especially in this enclosed space, Ritsuko could only reply dully. We had a lot of other secondary defences planned, but the primary function of Nerve is to field and maintain Evangelions. That was our only purpose. Anything that could reduce the focus from the Evangelions would diminish our primary combat potential. The place shook as one of the Angel's energy blasts finally pierced the outer shell of the geofront. Any defences down in the geo front would have been useful, even just to buy some more time, Masato thought, then shook her head. Shinji, get inside, we don't have much time. She grit her teeth and glared, losing patience. He deeply regretted it, but... No! I don't believe it. My father had to have known I maybe couldn't just hate him that much. Why take a chance? Why me? I don't think he'd risk the world on me. He never even knew me. If I was supposed to do this, shouldn't he have told me anything before now? I would have been glad to do it, to be needed by him. But now, there must be something else. He bit back his next words, for it might insult all those she already saw die under the monster's onslaught. I don't believe we're actually in any real danger. It was too convenient. A hero should leap at the chance, but he just couldn't grasp it was real. There had to be a trick. It couldn't be all about him. Not even his father would waste all that time and effort. He understood from his teachers that for the sake of survival there was very little that couldn't be sacrificed, and that in the end even children must fight. The clash of armies had also led him to appreciate, however, that grown men made for an effective fighting force simply because they had the physical and mental resilience necessary for the task. If you were down to using child soldiers, something had already gone hugely wrong somewhere. So it is the implausibility that deters you, Commander, not the duty in itself? Asked the Space Marine. To choose not to fight for humanity, it is inconceivable. Maybe it's just bad luck that it's attacking at the exact moment I arrived. Maybe they did expect to give me some time to acclimatise. But damn it, I still can't get over it. Even Father should know it's suboptimal as a defence. Is he being forced into doing this? Gendo liked the way the conversation was turning, but didn't show it. As expected, the boy was emotional and couldn't see the big picture. Throwing a childish tantrum was well within the boundaries of the scenario. This pilot is useless, he said to the bank of monitors near him. Send out Ray. Are you sure, Ikari? Fuyutsuki, his elderly second-in-command, asked for me. We both know she isn't ready. She's not dead yet. He replied, Why not simply cooperate, my bright lord? Trying to demand explanations or open terms at this point leaves you at a disadvantage. I'm no Amaro Ray. If you send the total neophyte out to fight, you just end up with your expensive weapon system and its pilot dead. This should be basic. They should know this already. Why would they even build a weapons platform that requires unreliable children instead of professionals? 
Perhaps it is your destiny. It is a giant robot, you are a teenager. There is no other way this can end except you getting into that pilot seat. I know that. I just wish... Is this why father called me? Why couldn't he just explain that there was a job for me to do? Hitting me like this out of nowhere. I know this. Trying to drive me emotionally off balance. Why? He didn't have to go this far. Just some basic decency. Just some information like I'm a person instead of just a tool. It's inept. That's what it is. Unwilling soldiers are not so effective soldiers. I just don't believe my father would make a mistake like that. It has to be intentional. But you will, of course, pilot that. Evangelion. Of course I'm going to fight. I'm going to let father think he's pressured me into it. When Masato-san asks again, I'm going to say okay. I don't want my own father as my enemy anyway. If I survive this, maybe I should apologise. It's a good enough excuse for us to talk, right? And into the Unit 1 cage, they reeled in Rei Ayanami, already in her plug suit, still bandaged and hooked up to an IV bag. Shinji looked on, up to his father, then back to her. No way. No way he would be this crude. This is raw emotional manipulation. Ray, the spear is useless, said Gendo. You will pilot the Evangelion. Yes, sir, said the girl, who weakly tried to sit up. She winced from the pain and faltered, but pressed on. She had blue hair. She had the finest pale white skin he had ever seen. She was a broken doll. His father... His father had taken this girl and broken her. He was going to let her die to prove a point. The depth of the man's gall far surpassed his worst expectations. Once more the chamber shook, but this time the angel had finally broken through. A cross-like pattern of directed energy pierced the geofront armour and stabbed down the space in between the shell and nerve proper. A building, a large one, separated from its locks and came crashing down into the lake. The earth shuddered and shook them off their feet. The blind corridor above was actually shut in glass, or Gendo might have fallen all the way to his death. He staggered, but kept an alert eye on what was happening below. Bleh. Shinji shit slid up on his back and saw Rei knocked off her gurney. She struck the ground and the pain must have been excruciating. Her back arched in agony. He ran up to her and tried to hold her up. She grit her teeth, squirming painfully even in his arms. Her jaw quivered with unvoiced agony. He held her, and she seemed so small, her bones so tiny and bird-like, even if the objective part of his mind noticed they both had pretty much the same build. He took one of his arms away from her side, feeling the wetness. He stared at his palm and saw blood. This makes even less sense. Is there really no one else? No adults, no professional soldiers to write that artificial human? Father! Shinji raged for Vin. He held the girl in his arms and watched her writhe in pain. How could he do this? She would have gone out and bled for him, died for him, instead of just explaining himself. You summoned pain as leverage? How could he use her just to force me into acting? Kicks him in the teeth, little boss. Boots to the head! Well, that might be difficult considering he's taller than I am. He had enough attention to spare for that, even as he parted some of the girl's hair away from her tightly shut eyes. She was so familiar. Like that brief vision he saw at the street. It couldn't have been this girl. But still, he felt as if he should know her somehow. How is that a problem? Remember, plan sequentially, the farseer said far too calmly. Kick him in the shin first, and when he lifts that leg to rub it, you may punch him in the genitals. Then when he is kneeling is when you may kick him in the teeth. Silence met her declaration, stretching out in the timeless nature of the mind. When you say things like that, the space marine was finally brave enough to say, is when I am reminded as to why your race ruled the galaxy for eons before humanity had even evolved as for our primate ancestors. At least you admit it, she replied, but it lacked her customary haughtiness. Look out! Someone yelled as another strike by the angel sent nerve shaking. A large metal beam broke from the ceiling and began to drop right over the children, spinning with deadly force in its descent. Miss Atto shut her eyes, not wishing to see the carnage. Shinji didn't really notice. He was still staring at the blood on his hand. There was a loud metallic crunch. Impossible, Ritsuko gasped. 
The Evangelion can't move on its own. Not while called. Not without power. But the Evangelion Unit 1 had not merely shielded Shinji and Rei. It brought its palm up and caught that beam, twisting it easily into a V-shape in its powerful grip. The Ava's clenched hand remained utterly still over the two teens, having moved so imperceptibly fast that the coolant spray kicked up by its motion was just now starting to sprinkle down. Shinji carried Rei up bridal style to her gurney. He placed her there, leaning against the turned-over bed. Looking at her pained face, sent his heart pounding with outrage. It was utter simplicity. He didn't know this girl, but it was a boy's job to make sure a girl doesn't get hurt. A man's job, even. Though still he felt there was more in life he wanted to enjoy yet with childish shamelessness. She's hurting. I'll do it! Shinji shouted out to no one in particular. He licked at Ray's blood on his palm, leaving a red track across his face, which disturbed nearly everyone. He made sure to swallow some of it, to fix the taste in his mind. His mind cleared, as if a plane of broke mirrored glass, only the black rage of the angel above sending ripples through the surface. It had all become absurdly simple. There was danger. There was injustice. Okay. If the adults were going to push it onto him, then all the voices in his head agreed he should just man up and try. He would fix it. He would fix it so people wouldn't be hurt by his inaction ever again. Unit 1's eyes glowed. Its jaws were still clamped shut, but it was like it wanted to laugh. I'll pilot the Evangelion.